Hello, I'm Mark Segris, and welcome to another edition of Perspective Wisconsin. You know, for more than a century, the historic Fister Hotel in downtown Milwaukee has played host to a variety of world leaders, sports stars, and dignitaries of all sorts. You just never know who's going to walk through the hotel lobby next. And this time of year, the lobby is trimmed in all its glory to reflect the spirit of the season. Chef Congier's Peter Mortensen serves as the official host of the Fister Hotel. It's his job to make folks always feel comfortable. He knows this great landmark from the inside out, its rich history, and the celebrities who consider it a home away from home. Let's go see Peter. Peter, it's so great to see you, and we appreciate your uh, invitation. My pleasure, Mark. Thank it's you great so to much. see you. The lobby here during the holidays always looks beautiful, and, and once again this year, it's uh, it's outstanding. Tell us about this tradition here. Well, the holidays at the Fister um, are not only not only are they just numerically the the culmination of the year, but they're really a chance for us to. really strap the jets to hospitality right. because this time of the year the Fister really becomes Milwaukee's living room. I mean this is, I tell people particularly if they're familiar with the old Marshall Fields in Chicago, I tell people this is the closest you're ever going to get to being able to sleep in the old Walnut Room. It has that same feeling. It's, it's that same sense of not just home but of home for the holidays, mm -hmm. of, of that big gathering of family. Only here, the family may be people that you've never met before. Yes. But once you come in, you're part of that, that ongoing party. Yes. That house party that's the Fister. And we're talking about uh, regular Milwaukeeans enjoying this to uh, international guests. You just said goodbye to an old friend this morning. Tell right. us about that. Right. Um, well, uh, one, of, one of our very, very, um, highly regarded guests um, and, and one who, who we're delighted to really, really welcome home is Doc Severinsen. Yes. Um, he was a long-term member of the Milwaukee Arts family. He was the, uh, for many years, the uh, Prime Symphony Pops conductor. Mm. And so we were accustomed to seeing him on a very, very regular basis every year. We even, I mean, we, there is a room that when he stays here, he is in. Uh, that is his home in Milwaukee. And Milwaukee has always appreciated oh, his grand holiday doubt. shows. Without a doubt. Now, sometimes you refer to as the chief concierge, but you go by chef concierge. Chef, explain well, this, explain well, because, that to us. Because chef, chef is simply the French for chief. Yes. Uh, a chef in a kitchen is the chef de cuisine. Uh, so for me, as, as a concierge, because there is no English word for yes. concierge. It, it, concierge is concierge is concierge. Mm -hmm. um, so to keep it consistent, we, we, I, I just refer to myself as the chef concierge. You are the official host. You are the image of the Fister Hotel. Well, I don't know. I don't know if I'm the image. I, I don't. I don't give myself that that grand a uh, <laughs> that perhaps that grand a, a, a title, but certainly. I like to think of myself as, and not just myself, but my staff and really all of us here who deal with the guests, we're here You're to the host. Well, we're here to guarantee that yes. anybody who comes to Milwaukee knows that they have a friend in town, mm -hmm. uh, knows that they have somebody who has their back, um, somebody who is, who is here and who is available to them in the same way that when you... Uh, the way that I defined it, for instance, when I would uh, give tours to children is they would say, because they never heard the word concierge, right. and say, well, you know when you go to grandma's? Grandma gives you a place to sleep, and she cooks for you. Mm -hmm. But if you want to know, you know, where's a good pickup baseball game, or, you know, where everybody goes to skateboard, or, you know, who, you know, where do you go if you want candy? Right. You have your friends at grandma's, right. and you depend on them. You don't go to grandma and say, where can I play baseball? Well, I'm that friend at grandma's. You know your hotel, and you know your city. Who stays here. You know yeah. your city. Yeah. It's obvious that you really enjoy what you do. So what's a typical day like for you, Peter? A typical day doesn't exist. 
Um, my agenda is always set on the other side of my desk. Mm -hmm. So uh, while I may come in with a list of things that I hope to accomplish on a given day, my first priority is you. My first priority is what your needs are, mm -hmm. what I can do, what I can put together to make things work for you. Mm -hmm. And that is, that, that for me is, is really the fuel of the job. That's mm. that's what that's what keeps me interested and exciting about it, excited about it um, is the fact that that I don't know on any given day whether I'm you know going to be making dinner reservations, whether I'm going to be um, you know booking cars, whether I'm going to be you know going out buying clothes for people because they lost their luggage. I mean it's. You have an amazing, it, amazing it, it, it schedule. Just, it, it just I it never. I would love to see the lobby, especially by all means. The seasonal time of year. Um, and well, this as, is really the best of the the year, as as I was uh, mentioning to you before. The lobby, as beautiful as it is, and it's certainly it's it's a jaw dropper. The ornateness um, of it is just breathtaking, Peter. But once it's decorated for the holidays. It's kind of like it just comes into bloom. Mm -hmm. It's like it's like the lobby itself has been waiting all year mm -hmm. to really throw out buds and, and bloom. And it's it's just it's an exclamation <laughs> of the holidays. Um, one of the things that, that we really appreciate is the fact that we're that we're part of a tradition in this city that that gives everyone a sense of ownership mm -hmm. of this that this is this this is our trust but it's Milwaukee's living room absolutely now this goes back to 1893 this mm -hmm. uh, this 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 beautiful uh, icon mm -hmm. um, the visionary for it was a gentleman by the name of Guido Fister mm -hmm. but his son mm -hmm. Charles was the one who actually built the Fister back then known as the mm -hmm. The uh, Grand. Well it, well, it was the Milwaukee Grand Hotel Company, mm -hmm. really. Now, what, how it how it came about, really, is it be, begins with tragedy. Yes. Um, the reigning Milwaukee Grand Hotel at that time, or in the latter part of the 19th century, was the Newhall House. The Newhall House had been built in the middle of the 19th century. It was uh, lionized mm -hmm. by. The, uh, the press, even as, uh, as far as the East Coast, as being the most luxurious hostelry. It was the, in the gathering West. place. It, uh, the, the, I mean, Milwaukee had a number of fine hotels, but the Newhall House, when it opened, the papers back East said that it could stand shoulder to shoulder with the, you know, the best hotels in the East. And of course, at that time, the East was the arbiter of what was civilized. Yes. So when it burned down, it was not only a huge tragedy in terms of in terms of loss of life and mm -hmm. it and it remains to this day i believe the the worst disaster in terms of loss of life of any mm -hmm. fire in the history of the city but it also left a void it it left a uh, a, a, a vacuum there that that place that when you wanted people to come to the city and introduce them to what was best about this new metropolis, mm -hmm. um, that was where you sent them. So civic leaders uh, needed mm -hmm. a new place. Right, and particularly um, it, it was becoming important because Milwaukee was making a transition from being uh, primarily, most industries primarily agriculturally based, mm -hmm. to really entering its period of preeminence as the what was called the machine shop of the world, yes. uh, the heavy industrial machinery that really powered the rest of the world into the heavy industrial age. Mm. Milwaukee was the Silicon Valley of that technology. And so it was very, very important to have this, particularly because word it had leaked out that the United States government was getting ready to build what was going to be the most expensive United States government commission building ever erected outside of Washington, D.C., mm. right catter corner across the street. That's yes. our federal courthouse. Yes. And that was an enormous investment that they were placing here in Milwaukee, both because of its 
emerging importance in terms of business and because of its importance as a shipping power. This mm -hmm. Milwaukee was for many years the busiest inland port in the world. And Guido and his son were both involved in numerous uh, business uh, interests well, oh, here yes, in the city, yes. weren't they, they? they? From insurance to railroad, mm -hmm. am I correct? Oh yes, oh yes. This was actually, there was a time when it was thought that the railroad head would end in Milwaukee. Really? And uh, up until the 1880s, it was assumed that, that all the railroads would, would meet here, and it was only subsequently with, or with the decision that Chicago, because of the disastrous fire there, could really be reconfigured as a city. Mm -hmm. that, uh, that uh, Chicago became the, the, the railroad head. After Charles uh, completed construction, the son completed construction uh, of the Fister, I mean, how, how close to the daily operation was he? Well, he, well he, was, he was very, very active, both he and Louise. Again, they, they had really stepped in um, when the project had, had gone fallow. That is that the, the, the Milwaukee Grand Hotel Company had purchased mm -hmm. the land that this hotel stands on. This was, this was residential area yeah. at that time. Um, and they had gotten that far, and then the project went dead. And it wasn't until the death of Guido Pfister in 1889 that Charles and Louise... His said, wife, Louise. Sister. Sister. His okay. sister, Louise. Mm -hmm. They essentially recircled the wagons and got the people back together again, did a new stock issue to a value of $500,000 mm. to build this grand hotel. Because this was the last philanthropic project that their father had been One involved in. One million dollars built this hotel. Well, 500000 was the original budget. Wow. They went over budget? Um, Charles and Louise took money from the estate because, again, they wanted this to be not just the best hotel in town. Sure or the best hotel in the West, yeah. or the best hotel in America. They wanted this to be the best hotel, period. So his heart was clearly in this operation. Well, it was, it, they were committed because it was something their father had left yes. unfinished. Yes. And it was a gift to the city. Mm -hmm. And so they essentially took that budget um, ended up buying back a lot of the, most of the original stock issue mm. and adding new technologies that had never been seen um, before. Mm. Um, this was one of the, one of the earliest purpose-built all-electric hotels in the country. Mm. This never had gas fixtures. Now this, to put this in perspective, when the, I mentioned the federal courthouse across the yes. street. Um, that was completed in the same decade as this hotel. That was not fully electrified until 1930. The standard at that time was <laughs> wow. to build with uh, electricity, but in case electricity turned out to be the hula hoop, sure. you had the gas as a backup. Sure. Charles and Louise wanted this to be the hotel of the future. Mm. And so what they did was they said, it's going to be all electric. Mm. Um, they could do that because we in this city manufactured what was the Bentley of electrical generators and that was the mighty Corliss engine. So the, the day that this hotel opened, May 1st of 1893, down the street from us in Chicago, yeah. another mighty Corliss engine was being flipped on by the President of the United States to light the white city of the, of the Chicago World Fair. Things fell in place. Yes. Um, Legend has it that Charles Hart and Zoll still go on, still live in this wonderful place. Well, we like to think that anyone who has ever been here mm -hmm. has left a part of themselves mm -hmm. here. Uh, share with me the, the architecture here. How would you describe the architecture of the, of well, the, the architecture, as we know it? The, the overriding architecture, architectural style, mm -hmm. is um, Richardsonian Romanesque revival. Okay. The, the architect for the hotel, or the architect of, of uh, note, was Henry C. Koch. And he was the architect of the German ascendancy in Milwaukee. Um, he was very, very, very fertile and a very, very busy architect. Uh, at the same time as he was doing this hotel, he was also involved with 
building the Church of the Jesu on the Marquette campus yes. and Milwaukee City Hall. And also some Milwaukee schoolhouses, oh, was yeah, he not? Uh, yes, I mean, he was, as I say, he was really the signal architect for public To put your name on Jesu and the Fister, that, that's pretty good and resume. And City Hall. And City Hall, pretty good resume. And so he had, each of the buildings had then their own overseeing architects. Herman Esser was the, the sort of upcoming young architect that was assigned to the Fister. Interestingly, Herman was engaged by Charles mm -hmm. in 1926, at which time he was the grand old man of the Coke Company, mm. to come back and work with Charles and Ray Smith to reconfigure and essentially redesign the Fister Hotel for the new century. Mm. So we have the continuity there of, of yes. the architect's eye as well. Yes, and we're standing just outside your artisan residence. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that fine program here. Well, the, the artisan residence program is something that is unique in the country. We are the first, um, and I believe one of only a handful of uh, hotels who have an artist in residence program. The idea for the artist in residence program here was really born by our art collection. Um, people come to see the Fister Art Collection. Uh, it, it is the largest collection that we know of uh, on permanent display of Solana genre painting from the 19th century through the early 20th century in any hotel in the world. Extensive Victorian. And rendering. it is all the original collection. Mm. It is a work of art in itself. It mm. is Charles' creation. Yes. This, this is his living letter to us telling us this is what I think the life of the Fister mm. is about. And it's reflected in his choices mm. of paintings. But in many cases, paintings are just, for a lot of people, objects. And they don't really think about how they happen. And so the Artist in Residence program gets people to really think about the genesis of these wonderful works mm. by showing them living artists working in their studios. Now, this corridor behind us that we just passed through, we have representative works of the previous three uh, original artists in residence. And our current artist is something of a departure for us. We had previously had painters. For the first time, we have uh, incorporated a, a different art form, and that is fabric art. And the current artist in residence is Timothy Westbrook. You want to step in here? Very accomplished. And we'll introduce I'll, you. I would like to meet him. Certainly. This is impressive, Peter. Well, <laughs> you are about to be even more impressed. This is Timothy Westbrook. Hello. Timothy, it's such a pleasure to meet you. In Wonderful residence. to meet you. I had the opportunity to see some of your work during a recent open house, and I was really impressed. I mean, you're doing you. some pretty progressive stuff. You're a fiber artist mm -hmm. and you reside in New York City? Uh, upstate New York. Upstate actually, New York. A photograph of the front yard. Yes, there. wonderful. <laughs> and uh, uh, share with us what the nature of being a fiber artist is. Sure, absolutely. Uh, so fiber, uh, meaning small cellular part, uh, being part of a greater structure. Uh, so that can mean uh, functional and non-functional art alike. Uh, in my work, uh, I use it to mean uh, that I'm fabricating cloth uh, with repurposed and found uh, items. And then Repurpose making- Repurposed meaning re recycled materials, right? Uh, repurposed uh, rather than recycled. Um, uh, these cassette tapes will not ever be cassette tapes again. So this they will not be- actually cassette that tape yes. is going to become cloth. Yes, so it's being taken away from its original purpose and put into a new. So wow. it's repurposed. Wow. Uh, and then uh, they will eventually become Victorian style ball gowns. So are you weaving it with? Are you weaving yes, it with, with cotton? With yep. cotton. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, and what kind of, what is the finished product like then? Does it become a very hardy it's material? Very soft. Yeah, absolutely. So here I've got a completed sample here. Wow. Uh, you can see it drapes very nicely, yes. um, but at the same time it's extremely durable. And the tape and gives it some sparkle, some, some glitz, yeah, huh? Absolutely. That's beautifully done. Ah, thank you. And you're doing this all in the uh, Victorian fashion. Yes, uh, Victorian style loom. Uh, it wouldn't have been much wider. Uh, on bed sheets, you'd actually even see a seam down the middle. Uh, and then all of the gowns uh, I'll be creating on a treadle sewing machine. Uh, so everything that you see there is done with an 1890s uh, non-electric treadle sewing machine. Well, would you mind while you're talking doing sure. a little weaving for us Absolutely. so we can see you? Absolutely, we can uh, do that. Wow. <laughs> 
How long does it take you to complete a dress? Uh, a dress uh, will take about three weeks. Um, so that is... Th That's pretty uh, fast, Peter. <laughs> Timothy. That is uh, 20, 21 full days of working, and a full day uh, means a 10 to 14 hour work day. Uh, and then uh, the, the weaving itself will actually take... This one is about 72 hours. I'll have about seven yards completed when I'm done. And then this actually took about 12 hours just to set up the loom. Wow. So um, talking about the dress construction actually doesn't even figure in how long the weaving itself can take. Why have you decided to pursue this uh, more progressive wing of traditional weaving, for lack of better description? Sure. Uh, well, all of the processes are non-electric. Uh, and I mentioned before that I'm actually from upstate New York. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm from the northern Adirondack Mountains in a place where we just revere nature and uh, sustainability is a part of the work that we do. Yes. Uh, so be, being able to figure out how far to go to rework materials to create them into being something wearable. I often like to say to folks uh, that when you step into my studio, you're actually stepping into a trash can. Mm. Everything in here would have been thrown away, and I've worked it into something uh, that you can walk away with as a wearable, fun, elegant piece. Wow, yeah. that's got to be very <laughs> satisfying. It really oh, does. It is really neat. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I'm just going to be quiet here and just, sure? oh, just enjoy watching the weave a little bit. <laughs> welcome, welcome. Here we go. <laughs> Maybe while you're weaving, you could describe the process for us, Timothy. Absolutely. Huh? Uh, so it all starts on what is called a warping board, and that is to my right, uh, where you actually will uh, map out all of the yarns. Uh, each distance across the warping board is about a yard. Uh, so you first make your decisions there. Then you bring um, the, the threads through individually. Uh, through this, these spaces here on the reed. Uh, each one of these frames is called a shaft with the metal heddles there. Uh, and then, uh, not to be confused with a metal head, metal heddles. Mm -hmm. uh, then you bring those threads through, through combination of lifting with each um, by using the treadle device. Uh, then you can see that the threads will lift up. I'll have a gap here referred to as the shed. And then the boat shuttles pass through that have the, the um, bobbin on them that has the thread, and then it creates your varying pattern. Mm. By pushing the reed forward uh, on the beater, you're actually able to compress the, the materials forward, and that's what makes the continuous cloth. Mm. It is physical work. Yes. Oh, absolutely. Eight months of uh, going like this, and I've uh, got these out of a surprise. Yeah, the biceps there, yeah. are clearly <laughs> built up from the experience. Yeah, it's, it's pretty wild. <laughs> so, I mean, how many hours a day are you actually weaving? Um, the actual weaving time, um, I would say about 75% of my time in here I'm weaving, uh, and I'm in this space uh, about 10 to 14 hours a day. And, and how difficult is it to... Uh, to be an educator at the same time you're, you know, performing your craft. Um, it's surprising. The the less I think about it, uh, the more I can, uh, the more I can do. So as soon as my brain starts getting involved, then I start messing up. Uh, and it's interesting that you decided to use the word educator. Uh, every time that a child comes in, the first reaction is, "Don't touch! Don't touch!" And uh, to quote someone from the uh, Lake Geneva Historical Museum, uh, "If you don't touch art, then art can't touch you." Yeah. And uh, I really truly. I'm educating people and bringing them right up and saying, hey, would you want to pass this, this you know, boat shuttle through wow. uh, and give it a try? I was standing here. Uh, this is actually how I spin and get all of the yarns onto the bobbin. And a seven-year-old gentleman came in and asked if he may try. And I said, well, absolutely. Uh, and That's it led trusting. to actually giving a, a seven-year-old uh, gentlemen uh, uh, lessons, weaving lessons out of the space for mm. a week. Uh, it, it's really incredible. Well, Peter, we're going to move on. Uh, Timothy, I'm sorry, we're going to move on. Wonderful. And we, we appreciate your hospitality. And hey, thank you for so stopping We're so impressed in. with what you're doing. Here. I appreciate it's that. It's outstanding. Thank Feel you so much. Feel free to stop back. Thank you. <laughs> Enjoy your tour. Joe, what a pleasure to meet you. Mark, great to have you with us.
This is Imperial Ballroom. Welcome to the historic Imperial Ballroom. What are we looking at? Tell us about the ornate nature of this gorgeous room. So when you think about being built in 1893, the original ballroom to the Pfister, some of the earliest uh, photographs that we have on record are actually McKinley's cabinet in this room at the turn of the century. Wow. Which boardroom seating for 600 uh, and coming through in the space, which turns into a little more luxurious space for us now, probably dinner closer to 280, 300 in this room. Sure. How many weddings, how many galas, uh, how many dances? Uh, it is one of those rooms where if you said if the walls could talk, you would want to be in the Imperial Ballroom and listen. I'm sure, I'm sure. Well, tell us about uh, how, when you went about restoring this room, how did you do that without harming the original nature of it? Uh, the entire Fister has such a responsibility to make sure that you respect the history uh, and yet keep it relevant for today. So when you look at the ballroom and the original chandeliers and then you look at the original ceiling work, uh, some of the master plaster uh, craftsmen that have come in, the master painters that have come through. We've really, in this space, when you think about the mirrors, the ceiling, and the artwork, that's as grand as you would have seen it 100 plus years ago. Mm. So then coming down into the, obviously it's new carpet, it's new draperies, but all done in the style of the property and making sure that when you come in and you're the next young princess that was just engaged that wants this to be your night, yes. or you're the next gala that you want to come into the Fister and have the decision made in this room, mm -hmm that's going to take us to the next century, you're as comfortable today as you would have been 100 plus years ago. Where do you find the artistic talent to, to restore this room? We've got a tremendous community here. It's actually a nationwide bidding process when we go out for renovation. So whether it's designers from Chicago, New York, Atlanta, what we found is some of the best craftsmen in the country are actually right here in Milwaukee. Mm. So we work with properties and companies that have the ability and the experience. And you go through with folks and you say, you know, what have you done before? Uh, but when you look at Marcus Hotels and Resorts, which is our parent company, and whether it's the Philip Hotel in Kansas City, the Skirvin in Oklahoma City. Uh, it's a bit of a niche market for us in being able to come in uh, and have an eye and a respect for the building, uh, for these city center properties that really make a difference in a community. What are the most common events to be held here in the Imperial uh, Room? Now. You'll see Monday through Thursday, you'll see a corporate meeting in here set. Uh, in this room, as we stand in it, you would have the stage here at the center uh, being able to speak uh, for a corporate luncheon. Uh, the room on a Friday night or a Saturday night will be a wedding, a uh, Sunday bar bat mitzvah coming through. Just the opportunity to have people enjoy this experience. You've got two blocks down, we see that uh, we've got the art museum and you watch the wings open and close on Calatrava's masterpiece uh, and absolutely the best view in the city for it. Now, you accepted the general manager's position here about five years ago. Correct. In so doing, you inherited a tradition. I mean, when it comes to hotel management, this is one of the crown jewels. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, this is one of the premier hotels, grand hotels in America. What was that What was that like? Well, there's a legacy, whether it's the Pfister family, whether it's the Marcus family. You know, Ben Marcus, when he saved this hotel from the wrecking ball uh, and came in in the early 60s, gave it to Steve Marcus, his son, now the chairman of our board. And so I sit in the chair that the chairman of the board sat in for his first decade with the company. Uh, and that gives you a little bit of respect for not only the position, but the over 400 associates that we've got in here every day. So when you think of the positioning within the community, and people will tell you that the Pfister is Milwaukee's hotel. Yes. You know, Marcus Hotels and Resorts happens to be the current tenant, uh, you know, or the landlord, but it's Milwaukee's hotel. Yes. So when you've got Milwaukee's hotel, you take um, a little bit of deference to every decision that you make, because it's not something that you can make for today. It's something that is being added to the legacy that's going to go on for years to come. During your watch here, you obviously are preserving a tradition, but you're also move, moving forward, being very progressive in the hospitality industry by launching such programs as the Artists in Residence was your initiative, for example. We just had the pleasure of speaking with Timothy at length. Uh, but uh, share with us some of the other ideas that you've you put on the table here for the Fister. Sure. It, when you think about uh, a historic hotel, and we talk about people who love history uh, and people who love a historic property, old property starts to cross the line where you say, I don't want to stay in an old hotel, I want to stay in a historic hotel. Mm -hmm. And if you define that difference, really in our world it becomes down to one word and it's relevance. So you can have as beautiful the bones and structure to a building as you want. If you don't have relevance with your programming, you don't have relevance with your staff, you don't have relevance with the guests that are in the programming there, um, then all of a sudden you slip mm -hmm. and you're no longer an icon, all of a sudden you're a relic.
Mm -hmm. So in our world, we've added in, as you mentioned, the artist in residence program five years ago here in the property. Um, th the first three uh, painters coming in were visual artists. Then all of a sudden, uh, we get a national applicant from New York who moves here, uh, who said, you mentioned Timothy, yes. and he's a fiber artist weaving cassette tape and recycled <laughs> materials in into Victorian dress. ball gowns, <laughs> Victorian dresses. It's an amazing thing that pushes our boundaries a little bit. We also added in the Fister Narrator program as a writer in residence. And I'm sure you know Dr. Hollander, who's played here nearly mm -hmm. 30 years now. Uh, he's been the resident musician for decades. Mm -hmm. And trying to say, what's the next thing? We said so many people come here and have moments uh, that turn into lasting memories for their family. Mm -hmm. And we're looking for ways to share those. And how do you share it? In the old hotels, you might have done a book. You might have had something that you'd issue out, maybe a radio story. Today, it's blogging. Yeah. So our Fister narrator comes in, would meet you sitting in the lobby. Perhaps you're here with family, friends on a reunion, uh, but would tell your story then on the Fister blog. And that's something, again, as you look at relevant in today's world, uh, we've received two social media awards this year, mm. uh, one for the best blog internationally of any hotel, uh, and one for the best integrated digital media campaign, which as we involve the public in the voting for the artists and residents, uh, and you say 2012 digital media campaign and social media awards and a historic property, you wouldn't always put in the same sentence. Yes. So it's neat to be able to bring those two together. You are a community. You're more than a hotel. You're really a community. You're, exactly you're right. You're a neighborhood within your boundaries. And, and once once you've stayed here, you're part of that community. Mm -hmm. So it's an interesting hotel. And, and you know, back in the day you know, when we were first built, there was a social class and there was a price that you would pay to come. Now it's anyone comes. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a tree lighting the Friday after Thanksgiving where we have a lobby of 500 plus people from all ranges within the community uh, as a complimentary event to really say thank you to Milwaukee mm -hmm. for the part that we play in it and whether again whether you're a CEO whether you're first starting out in business whether you're somebody who's lived in Milwaukee all your life or a one-time visitor you have that opportunity to come in and just really become a part of what's this 120 year magic history well your progressive ideas in, in terms of hospitality management should be no surprise you're, you're kind of a renaissance guy anyway basketball led to your involvement in pursuing a degree in the hospitality industry. Share that Absolutely. with our viewers, if I you would. And ended up at University of Wisconsin Stout. Yeah. Uh, came in, transferred just a week before the season started because I was recruited by a coach who changed jobs. And he called and said, I'm going to Wisconsin Stout. Do you want to follow me there? I said, Absolutely. Let's go see what that's all about. <laughs> it was closer to home than the other university. Uh, and came in and said, you know, what's this school known for? And at that time, two national programs. One was fashion merchandising and one was hotel restaurant management. Hotel restaurant management was the one for me, so it became a summer program really as a way to play basketball. Uh, and 25 plus years later, uh, here we sit in one of the most iconic properties in the country. Joe, thank you so much. We've really enjoyed our visit. Mark, a pleasure. We wish you all the best, sir. Thank you. Can we walk out together? It'd be our pleasure. Okay. Even the carpets are outstanding. Every day. <laughs> I guess, is this the point of the story where we say we're ready for a close-up? <laughs> <laughs> Boy, a grand entrance and a grand exit, Peter, Yes. Huh? I've really enjoyed our visit. You've well, been it's gracious. Been a, it's been a pleasure for us. It's always a pleasure to welcome somebody home to the Fister. Oh, happy holidays to you. Happy holidays to you from me and Dick and Harry oh. and all of us at the Fister. Okay, all the best to you. You have a wonderful day. All right, Peter. Happy holidays.